Hello, hello. This is Silas. I'm here with my friend Steven. Say what's up. Hello, everyone. This is going to be a kind of definitions or keep things to keep in mind series <laughs> it's going to continue. It's, it's going to accompany our current discussion on cracks in the ivory tower, the moral mess of higher education by Jason Brennan and Philip Magnus. And this is about the, I don't, I don't know what the right term, the school industrial complex or something. The school education industrial, industrial, industrial complex. complex. Okay. I mean, education might be kind of off, but I think we'll, that's part of why we're having this conversation because I think there's a difference between like education and schooling. Yeah. Like what's going on in my from my estimation is more schooling versus education. But this is this is going to be a, a video where we're going to be discussing some important things that we're going to constantly refer back to while we're having this uh, twelve part conversation. We recorded the first part, and this came up in it, and as it happened with the previous conversation we had about critical theory. We had a separate video where we were talking about the definition of postmodernism to make people understand when we mention postmodernism in the following parts of the series, that's what we mean. So with this one, I think we're going to be talking about, there's going to be uh, two things. Stephen will open up with something, then we'll talk about the um, seven big economic insights, normative business ethic questions, and descriptive business, business ethic questions. And those are things to keep in mind that the authors also had in mind while they were writing this book, researching this book, and why it's important and things that we agree with. So, um, Stephen, I think we'll open up with uh, a few quotes that you pulled out of why you think this is actually shows that this is a central thing, both for the book and just life in general. Sure. So there's two there's two very important points that I want to emphasize. And again, you should you should remember these as you're watching this series. But I think you should just remember them in general because they do they do describe the world more generally. Big trends emerge from individual behavior without anyone running the show. Institutions create incentives and incentives determine behavior. Economics 101. Those are something you should bear in mind because, as I said in the, the video of the first chapter, a lot of people tend to want to they want to attribute certain phenomena to conspiracies or there's some group of people running the show. But the, the authors are arguing, and of course we are too, that no, this is the result of certain people setting certain rules in certain institutions, which in turn influences how people act. And those decisions have consequences both on the other people in the institutions and even the country at large, depending on what we're talking about. So it's worth bearing that in mind when you want to know, hey, why are people acting this way? It's because the incentives are such that it incentivizes people to act in that way. Yeah. And with that one, I think uh, this is a realization I came up with. <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I was some real mental issues, looking at the things that were happening in the world as I was trying to create a a own universe, creative universe of my own, some thing called Carbon, that was something I started working on as a kid. Not as a kid. I, I guess as a kid relative to now. <laughs> Back in the two, early 2000s when I was in college, I started working on this story that was based off of the Final Fantasy universe, this video game universe and all these ideas, and eventually grew to be my own. So I was like, okay, I have to develop political systems, develop economies, like financial economies. How is the market going to work? How are people going to be delivering things? What's going to be the reasons that you're going to have different systems of law? And I started looking at examples of what's happening in actual reality. And I was still a little bit more of the conspiracy theories. And it got to the point where I realized the, the only thing scarier than any conspiracy theory is realizing that there's no conspiracy theory, that this is just the way things are. And people seem to have that need where they want to feel that, oh, there's actually some controlling power, be it a deity or God or some other system that's oh, things are bad because of this one particular thing that I can identify and that maybe adjust. And if I pray or if I account for this other thing, I'll be able to stop this one thing. But in general, it's just nature. It's just the way people interact, that some bad things happen, some good things happen. We just pay less attention to the good. And I think that's kind of where this, uh, this is a good insight to have, where maybe it's not a conspiracy. Maybe they're actually just things that happen. And to me, I think that's, First of all, it's more realistic to what reality is. It's more accurate to what reality is. But at the same point, just because these many things happen, for this bad thing happen, focus, think about all the other positive things. Think about how much worse those bad things could have been. And also realize that since there isn't a big bad out there that you have to battle, you personally can be an agent of major change, both in your life and the lives of other people around you, because you might be that first thing that thinks about something, says something, does something 
that leads to all these other people doing positive things. Yes, exactly. Uh, so the and next one was? This one I really like. Universities' problems are deep and fundamental. Most academic marketing is semi-fraudulent. Grading is largely nonsense. Students don't learn or study much. Students cheat frequently. Liberal arts education fails because it presumes a false theory of learning. Professors and administrators waste students' money and time in order to line their own pockets. Everyone engages in self-righteous moral grandstanding to disguise their selfish cronyism. P professors pump out unemployable graduate students in oversaturated academic job markets for self-serving reasons and so on. <laughs> so this this book and these discuss this discussion is going to cover all of these things. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, this one, again, you can you can go in and you can put arguments against it. But I, I think some of these things are practical. The numbers are out there, the examples are out there. It, it might be of interest to anybody who's, who's listening to this. My background in education, my postgrad was uh, graphic design, and then uh, <laughs> graphic design and animation with a postgrad. Pre like my graduate was was graphic design, and postgrad was some course in uh, typical no, critical animation, not concepts of animation. I can't even remember this thing, right? It's not that important to me, but for some people, it's important. So, for my background is liberal arts in school, and yours, Stephen. So I, I just have culinary school, Culinary Institute of America yeah. after high school. <laughs> so we're coming from that field. So someone was like, oh, we're biased from being in the STEM fields. No, we're, <laughs> we're not STEM people. These are things that we just observed and in this practicality sense. And we both make our living somewhat, Stephen more directly in that. I guess also for me, I, I do like freelance stuff. <laughs> where I'm working with those things that I learned. But we've learned a lot of things outside of it. And we've also taken in a lot of um, information and education outside of the schooling that we actually had. So I think with this one, it's it's true. Some of the things, some of those things that literally just think with some of the majors out there, what is the practical exact, what is the practical <laughs> actual application of some of those majors if it's not teaching those, those things to other people? It's, 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 it's an interesting thing out there. So, yeah. And I, I keep harping on this over and over, but I, I've been delving into more public choice theory stuff lately. Public choice, for those who don't know, it's the it's using economics to address the problems of political science. The reason, the whole reason it emerged, and they talk about this early in the book, was because the old way used to be believed that okay, people are just rational actors in the economy, and people will make good decisions, so allow freedom. Now we're sort of coming from that perspective. We can get into the weeds of that. That's a whole conversation, which we'll probably do next with human action. But yes. the pushback against this is something like, well, here are the problems caused by laissez-faire. Here are the externalities, all that. So we need we need bureaucracy. We need good agency staffed by good people to run it, and then everything will run smoothly. Now, the pushback against this, courtesy of James Buchanan, Gordon Tullock, jo George Stigler, and other people, was that, no, the, the people staffing these agencies, they have self-interest, they have motives, they have incentives, all that. And... If if you just, just this idea of oh we just put people in charge have them supervise everything everything will run smoothly no it falls apart because those same people they want raises they want promotions they want prestige I reposted a good article recently written by a guy who was in the EPA for thirty years and he talked about all the corruption there how like oil executives would have relationships with regulators how regulators who tried to do the right thing the lobbyists would get them fired of course. Lo the regulators who play ball with the lobbyists, as it were, the lobbyists put in a good word for them in their companies. They get jobs later working for those companies, all that. And again, this, this isn't to say that these people are evil. It's just people responding to incentives. It's they want promotions. They want raises, all that. So this this repeatedly insisted idea of we just need better people running things. I don't I don't see how or why it's valid, because, again, they're not really measuring these people on how ethical they are, number one. And. Yeah. I keep bringing up the point that even if you get these good people, what happens when they leave? You're, you're, it's going to be back to self-interested people just doing what they yeah. want to do. And nobody has convinced me as of yet that somehow people in power are shielded from this effect. So Yeah. And that's the Environmental Protection Agency that you mentioned with the yeah. EPA there for some of our <laughs> non-American-based people. But with this book as well, it is focused on the schooling system in the United States of America. But... I still think a lot of places in the world follow the lead of the United States of America. They have this, this, mm, this illegitimate or this wrong view of thinking that wealth is somehow the natural of humanity. And I think Thomas Sowell puts this in a good way where 
he's talking about how poverty is the general nat- natural state, and we have to yeah. think about okay, when there's actual prosperity, when there's actual wealth, when there's actual civilization, when there's actual peace, those are the things that are unusual from this the general state of nature. So we should look at why does that happen. Yeah. And I think whether we consciously do it or not, a lot of the countries look at the United States of America and say, oh, we want that kind of wealth, we want that kind of standard of living. Oh, are they doing it because of their schooling system? So we need to adopt the schooling system. Are they doing better because they have an environmental protection agency? Oh, so if that's what's happening in their EPA, we should follow that. That's why a lot of people are out there currently like, oh, I can't believe Trump pulled this out, pulled the United States of America out of the, the Paris Accords. Because they feel they're saying America still sets that kind of example for the world. So that's why I think this conversation is important, not just for the people in the United States of America, but the world in general, because we're getting to an increasingly globalized world that people look at examples from places that are doing much better, and they want to copy what's happening in those places. And my major objection to some of these collectivist type of central planning type of things or putting so much power into one place is not necessarily, oh, I want to keep all the good positive things that I might possibly earn. I don't want any of you butchers out there getting none of my gifts. No, I'm I'm more concerned of somebody else doing something horrible than then socializing the negative effects of that thing and have it spread to all these other people, including me, that I, I had nothing to do with that decision. I wasn't the one who decided to do things that way. But because we've given this person so much power and influence, even the bad things they do, and in most cases, the bad things they do are the ones they socialize, and the good things they do, they try their most to keep as much of that as possible. So, yeah. And, and I keep insisting, too, like, don't think academics are some sacred class that are somehow above corruption and self-interest. It's the same thing with, I was going to say some politicians, but especially Democrats. People have this idea like, oh, these people have power. These people are these institutions. Somehow they abandon self-interest and they're doing this to serve other people and all this. But it, I, I haven't seen a single thing to convince me that these people don't have self-interest as well. L- l- yeah. I'll get into this more in the next section, but look at how much academics get paid in some cases. Look at the prestige they get. Look how little time they spend actually working. And then, of course, politicians, that's a whole separate conversation. Why is Nancy Pelosi worth $20 million on a six-figure salary? Why does Bernie own multiple homes? All this. And again, it's like if you're in that position – it's 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 very tempting. It's like who's to say we would? I'm not arguing like I wouldn't do the same thing. But again, it's like this idea that somehow they abandon self interest and just care about other people. I I haven't seen a single thing to convince me of that. And it, it just keeps coming back to oh we'll get better people, we'll get better people. And yeah, you might get that one out of every few million people. Like for example, there was a woman from my area who don't won millions in the lottery and she actually donated it all to charity. So occasionally yeah. there are people like that, but I don't see how that's the majority of people by, by and if anything, they go the opposite direction. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even stating that self-interest is a negative thing. Self-interest no. is a positive no. thing. It's the, the more people that are actually self-interested, that means you have an identity yourself. You try to do what's best for you. And it is, it has been shown that it is best for us to do, to be more, Collaborative, 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 <laughs> and to be of more use to other people, to coexist, that is better than just completely saying, I'm going to go around and start punching people in the face. What is best for you? Just think about it in general. That's a simple one. Is it better for you to walk around and just punch random people in the face? Or is it better for you to walk around and wave and smile to random people? I think in one of those, like, maybe it's best, better to do none <laughs> for rest of people. But if you're told to pick one between the others, in general, being more more liked, being more useful. And this is the thing. There's nothing wrong with something being useful. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be useful to other people. There's nothing wrong with valuing people that are useful to you. And you see that. And that is why – that is the state of nature. Nature is selfish. It cares about the self. So you start from the self, you start from the individual, and then you build up stronger actual environments because you understand that person is going to do something in their self-interest. And it's in that person's self-interest to have as many people around them who are also interested in their own safety and the collective safety of the group. And we're in things together. We decided we're going to come and do this thing together, have this conversation together, make this definition thing together. Because it's in our self-interest that you out there better understand what we're talking about because we find there's going to be benefit both from you listening to more of our videos and also for the world in general. It does come from a point of self-interest. Well, yeah. I, I always I always I was thinking a lot lately of Obama with all the stuff he used to say about like 
oh, there will be time for them to make profits. Now is not that time. Okay, what did he buy? A 20 something million dollar home on Martha's Vineyard? <laughs> and, and and it's like, and, and look, and then, like I said, I mean, if people were willing to pay thousands of dollars to hear me speak, trust me, I'd be out there doing it. I'm not knocking him yeah. for doing that. It's just don't give me these lectures on, we need to put our self-interest aside and care about other people. Because look, if he really believed that deep down, he'd be donating probably most of his salary to charity or something. He wouldn't be living the high life. So yeah. again, I don't knock him for, for taking advantage of his prestige and reputation, but then don't give me lectures on how important it is to self-sacrifice, blah, blah, blah. Uh. Yeah. And that's one of my things I think is appeals about is appealing about Trump. He just comes out and says like, "Yeah, wealthy. Yeah, I, I like these things. This is how I live." And I think a lot of people see that and they find it more genuine to what happens in their actual lives. Yeah. And when it goes to the actual, why would he actually run when he's mentioned that oh he's lost billions? Relatively, technically, yes, from his general perception, he's not taking in a salary, so he could be not president. And earning a lot more money, and his Trump name wouldn't be as garbage as it is in the general um, sphere of society, of the social sphere. So I think when he says that, he does have other interests. There's other interests that I think are there, where he's like, okay, is it better for Trump if the United States of America is a more successful country? I think it is, and I think that's enough self-interest for him, for him being like, I really, really like this country, and now. How does he define that country? How do you define that country? Those are things that come into the actual a equation about this whole thing. So with that, do you think we should get into the reading of the actual things now? Well, I was, just gonna say, I was gonna just say two things. So okay. regarding Trump, one point that I think it was Stefan Malin who made, which really stuck with me is like, look, he, he as you just said, he's been losing money. He, the, he knew the media would drag him all this. Would he do all of this unless he believed he truly believed in the country and wanted to make a difference? Yeah, part of it is for his own ego. I realize that. But it's like he didn't need the money. He didn't need the prestige. It's like, why else would he be doing this? Why else would he donate his salary? Why else would he be willing to take losses? All that. Again, it's like whatever you think of Trump, at least ask those questions. I think that's fair. So and if it's his ego, sorry, if ahead, it's his ego, what would be better for his ego? The country yeah. failing after while he's there or after he leaves or the country doing better? Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. So the, the questions, uh, we, we're, we're going to get into the seven big economic insights. But first, I'll, I'll start. I would say uh, ask these questions here. What incentives do the rules create? Who bears the costs of people's actions and choices? Who benefits and why are the rules the way they are? So uh, think about that again, not not even just this discussion, but just in general, whether it's politics, economics, day to day life. I think those are valid questions people should be asking. Yeah. So I think with that, let's get into that. And remember, ask those questions both while we're actually reading these descriptions and for the rest of the series. And um, we'll try to apply some of them to the actual questions and we'll go point by point. I will be reading the point point by point, and then Stephen will give some insight on the different points, and we'll have this short discussion that way, but we're going to try to keep it concise. Okay, so starting with the seven big economic insights. Number one, there are no free lunches. Trade-offs are everywhere. The most basic, important, and frequent evaded topic, frequently evaded topic, sorry, <laughs> we'll start that one again. Apologies. Seven big economic insights. Number one, there are no free lunches. Trade-offs are everywhere. The most basic, important, and frequently evaded economic idea is that everything you do comes at the expense of everything you didn't do. So yeah, uh, expand a bit on that. That's the, the um, lost opportunities thing. It is an actual technical term for this. Uh, opportunity costs. Opportunity costs. Yes, sorry. I, so, some of these terms, like I know the ideas, but I'm not good at the actual terms, which is why I want to make some of these definition title videos. So, so think of it this way: everything you do in life requires trade offs. Uh, time I'm spending talking to Silas, I could be spending time watching something else. I could be out for a walk. All that. Obviously, everyone's going to live a certain amount of time. We don't know how long it's going to be for each person. Hopefully, you obviously you want to live a long time, but who knows? Life throws all sorts of surprises at you, but all that time that you have available to you, you have to manage. You can't do every single thing you want to do. You couldn't You couldn't spend a whole life in school, earn all sorts of degrees because not just financially, but all the time spent. At some point, you would have to earn money and it would be, okay, well, time you spend in school is not time you spend in the workplace. And that's something that people like these authors and also the founders of Praxis have talked about that 
if you spend time in school learning things that you never end up using, well, you could have spent a year or two working in a place and you, that could have landed you a promotion that could have landed yeah. you a reference, something like that. So yeah, however, however you spend your time again, even if you spend time just watching a show, it's like that could be time you could spend studying something. So we live in this world of trade-offs and then if you did, if you're one of these people who again says, "Oh, I don't care about economics, money, blah blah," well, okay, again, I mean, the resources that are in the things that you buy, those could have been used for other things, and that factors into the cost. We we live in a world of near unlimited demands and but limited resources. That's why these trade offs exist. If if these trade offs didn't exist, there'd be no reason to study economics. Everyone could just have whatever they want. Yeah. And economics is a big focus on just time. That's yeah. that's a time preferences. It's about the time preferences that you do things. And even even when you're in school, when you get into education, when you get into the system and you choose your major, when you choose a major, you can't study multiple majors at once. Yeah, you can do double majors. You can do like a major and a minor. But you don't hear people but triple majoring because you just yeah. literally don't have that much time in the day to study any particular things at any particular time. And again, thank you for taking the time to, to listen to us <laughs> at this time. Okay, so moving on to points two. Number two, there are always budget constraints. Consider this a corollary to the last point. American universities spend about half a trillion dollars each year. Overall, U.S. higher education is a $500 billion industry. So yes, yeah, so why, why did he say spend about half a trillion? Okay, half a trillion. I thought it said a trillion, then he said $500 billion. So yes, $500 billion a year. So uh, this one, uh, what do you think about this with the whole... We need to fund schools more. We don't, we need to spend more money on education. That's a, that's a common thing. Well, and, and this will un, this will unfold more as the conversation goes on. But just think about where all this money goes. It's that's that's one of the arguments that we'll ultimately be making. I think, at least, I will. That look, if if you look at where all this money goes, this is why the schooling is so expensive. It's not. It's it's that joke I always make fun of about. Oh, I'm not going to teach you this. This would cost thousands in university. Well, are, is that information so valuable or is it massively inflated and you're just paying for all these other things that don't really benefit you and you don't really want? It's not that information in of itself is so valuable. You have to look at where that money is going towards other things and all that. And again, to what you just said, they always say, oh, we need more funding. We need more funding. Well, who pays for that? It's either going to be higher tuition or if, if it's publicly funded, okay, they raise taxes on everyone to pay for that. It's not like... There's this unlimited pile of gold somewhere that they just take more from and they pay they pay for it. No, it's everyone pays for this in some way or another. And we'll, we'll again, we'll get more into this when we're talking about how things are funded. But it, on the surface, it's, oh, a few bucks for this, not a big deal. A few bucks for this, not a big deal. But you add up that effect times hundreds or thousands. Well, this is why you're paying all this money for your schooling. Yeah. OK. So yeah, without when it's just <laughs> got like a big pile of money. Uh, when you when you hear big pile of money, what do you think? I, the two things I normally think of the Scrooge McDuck kind yeah, of money yeah, bin, yeah. or like Smog, the the dragon from uh, the Lord of the or from uh, the Hobbit, where it's just like yeah. this big pile of money, Smog, so on. Okay, so <laughs> moving on to number three, incentives matter. When we want to predict our, or explain behavior, we should ask who benefits, who pays. Uh, if people are rewarded for doing something, they'll tend to do it more. If they're punished or made to bear a cost, they'll tend to do it less. If people can reap the benefits of something but push the costs onto others, they'll tend to do so. And now with that one, that's what I was mentioning before with this whole idea of putting so much power on some people. When the costs come, and those are te negatives on the actual things, then they will push those on to everybody else. When the actual profits come, the, the positives, they'll try to keep as many of those to themselves. So it's it's good to decentralize and spread that about. What, what, do, you, what do you think on this one? Well, th this goes to my point I just made about Obama. Like, again, if, if people are saying, hey, we're going to pay thousands to hear you speak, of course he's going to go out and do it. And again, I don't knock him. I would do the same thing. But – the, the same thing applies to academia as well as the political sphere. OK, you want to run for office. Well, you have to raise a lot of money. Who's going to give you money? Big corporations. The corporations are not just going to give you money because they're going to say, OK, we'll fund your campaign if you do these things once in power. So, of course, naturally, politicians are going to do what they want. People will keep saying, represent the people, represent the people. This. OK, whatever, again, back to Trump, whatever you think of him, he was self-funded. And that's what caught on with a lot of people is that, OK, if he's paying for this himself, he's not going to be bought by certain people. I know when Obama first ran, I think they said, like, what was it? Goldman Sachs gave him more money than all of their Republican candidates combined that year. Well, why do you think that is? It's because they expect things in return. He's not going to turn it away. He wants the money for his campaign. But then again, once he's in office, what's he going to do? It's and again, we can get into, is he a good or a bad person? Well, all that, but it's like, 
that just those simple incentives, you want to run for office, you need money, people give it to you, but in return, they expect favors. If you want to run again, you're going to have to do certain things to get another round of donations. Again, it's not rocket science. It's just people looking at the incentives and what is their self-interest. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that one is, it's not necessarily bad. What, what were your incentives? I'm asking the people out there, what were your incentives to decide yeah. to listen to this video? That'd be interesting to, to know. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to number four, yeah. the law of unintended consequences. When we pass a rule making, sorry, when we pass a rule making a change or advocate a policy, we can say what we hope to accomplish, but we don't get to stipulate what we will actually accomplish. In general, almost every change brings unintended and unforeseen consequences. So, yeah, some thoughts on this one? Well, yeah, I mean, that's just externalities in general. Like I think I mentioned previously, if I open a factory and I generate smoke, that can blow down into the neighboring field. Someone could inhale that. Someone could get cancer. Again, that's not because I'm deliberately trying to kill people, but those things have consequences. Same things with all our policies and everything. Okay, you blow up a village, you create terrorists because you radicalize the relatives of those people. Those people in turn join ISIS and attack American bases. So yeah. you can say, okay, we weren't trying to create terrorists, but again, the the effects of what you do, it's going it, what the the impact of what you're doing, it's going to have those effects. Mm. One of these ones, I think I'll tie this in with uh, in incentives and also opportunity costs. My tie in three of the things that we've talked about here, where you have certain incentives in the United States of America, certain affirmative action incentives where they say, oh, you need to hire this many people, especially when you're focusing on schools. Let's keep the schools here. They say you need to have a certain amount of applicants or a certain amount of people joining your school of X race or mm. X group. So this group, this school says, okay, if we have those, there's grants by the government to give millions of dollars if we actually achieve these certain numbers. So they look at actually getting as many of those people into their schools, and they might even, in some cases, lower the standards of those people. They might say, okay, this other group has 100 people who are, who are in the top, top 15 percentile of their actual achievements, of their actual levels to actually enter our school, but we have to get majority or a certain number of this other group that's only around the bottom 15 percentile. So we'll take that bottom group and more of those groups and keep those people from the top out. Now you bring those people into the school. Unintended consequences in there could be both your school itself at the end won't be achieving as many things in the research developments or the post-grad people actually graduate and go on. In some of those cases, some of those people from that lower point that come in, they were already maxed at their ability and now they could have gone to other schools that could have benefited from people at that level and raised their levels of achievements in that level. And they could have actually end up graduating. Since they're put in this harder environment, this harder school, they don't actually get to the point where they actually graduate. They get dissuaded from it. And they look at all these other people achieving at such higher levels and they start comparing themselves to something else. And then you have those people kind of drop out and get disen disenfranchised with the whole idea of schooling and education and start thinking the system is against them. So that's an unintended consequence. That's the incentives right there. That's a lost opportunity cost from the other universities by you saying we're going to take all these people and put them in our school just because we need them. So those are things that tie in there that, that are very important to keep in mind. Well, I was, I was thinking too, even like that whole thing with Bill Gates and IBM, how originally he worked for IBM and he offered to do what he did there and they said no. And then, of course, down the line, he went off, started Microsoft. And, of course, they were kicking themselves. Oh, we could have had this great technology. IBM could have been a few times wealthier than it is now. But, again, at the time, what do you know? Oh, here's some younger, geeky kid who dropped out of Harvard. How is this going to – what's going to come out of this? It's easy to look back and say, oh, they should have done this. But at the time, who knew? Uh. Yeah. And that's, that's why – going back to what we talked about earlier was there's not some big – mafia or, or Illuminati out there that was like, oh, we need to kick Bill Gates out of, out of uh, we need to kick him out of, what's it called, out of IBM, so eventually he can start his own company, and then now he's going to invent his own Illuminati and start destroying it. It's like, no, people just have different incentives, and they yeah. do different things, and, and that, those are the things that happen. Okay, yeah. moving on to number five. People often break the rules when they can. Or in fancier language, people engage in strategic non-compliance. I think with that one, anybody who has a job, or even if you have your own business, I think you can think of some times where you kind of skirted some kind of general agreement, general rule, and mm. some can be deadly. But in general, I think we do we do this a lot. Yeah, thoughts on that? We'll, we'll we'll get into it in the chapter about moral language. But there's there's a really interesting book I haven't read it, but they cited about the elephant in the brain. It's called where they talk about how 
we find ways to rationalize our behavior where it's like we're not being outright evil, but we find ways to sort of bend the rules and justify it in our own head. And I think I mentioned it in the previous video, but in there's that very good one from the real life Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street guy, where he talks about how he became corrupted. And it was the same thing. It's it's not, oh, I woke up one day and decided to swindle all these people. It's I'll charge a little more for this. I'll lie a little bit about this. I'll just. And, and you, you, by the time when, when you, you look at where he started and where he ended, that that's what happened. And, and I've seen this, too, with people who cheat on their spouses or partners. It's the same thing. Oh, I'm just meeting her for drinks. Ah, She just kissed me on the cheek. Uh, like you keep finding ways to rationalize incrementally in your head and it gets worse and worse. And eventually it's like, oh, wow, what have I done? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so it's human nature. To- I mean, I'm not above it either. So, oh. yeah. I was listening to the Bill Whittle show, and he was talking about something with the with the with the campaigns or the debates, and he was saying when it comes down to it, it's often a question of if this is a question he asked a lot of people when they ask about leaders when they ask about presidents. If I had a loved one whose life was depending on someone, one of these two candidates, and one of them had to lie on behalf of my loved one in order to save their life, who would I trust more? That was an interesting way of looking at things. And I think when you talk about politics, politics is about lying. It's like professional lies, yeah, illegal is. lies. Yeah. So when people are like, oh, shock, I can't believe these politicians act in this way. I'm like, what do you think politicians are about? Like, that's what politics is about. Like, they, if they're honest, I'm like, shock. I'm like, wow. <laughs> that's the point where you're like, okay, if they actually follow all the rules, then that's not really politics. It's all about skirting the rules and making these things. And that's part of why these regulations and things like that also occur, where they find ways to kind of be like, okay, let's set up enough rules where we're able to comply with these rules, but these other people are not able to comply with them. And if you actually had to comply with every single rule and law that's out there, that whole thing that people say, well, we'd be in jail a hundred times a day would be yeah. federal crimes and things like that. No matter what country you live in, it's it's a common thing. Well, well, okay. I, I laugh, too, because there was something I saw going around about like, oh, the good old days when families were together and politicians were honest. <laughs> all this. I'm like, when were politicians ever honest? I mean, read about yeah. li- the real the real stories about Lincoln and Washington. It's like, you know, some people say Washington married his wife because she was connected. He was able to get access to these plantations. He had mm-hmm. Washington, D.C. set up where it was. So his the value of his in- estate would increase. It's like this has always been the case. This is it like there's sort of this idea that there's this romanticized era when, oh, these were true statesmen who put their self-interest. No, I mean, this is this is how it's always been. <laughs> it's just yeah, it's, it's, it's it's easier in retrospect to look at it with rose colored glasses. And then and, and I always, again, back to Obama, I always bring up like. Recent times, especially with the Internet, is running about promises with Obamacare. Look at what happened. And again, I realize it's not 100 percent his fault. You have to go up against the American Medical Association. He had to go up against the insurance company. So it's not something that's easily fixable. But he wanted to get elected. So, of course, he's going to tell everyone what they want to hear. And then the consequences don't it doesn't pan out as expected. Oh, well, not my problem. I'm out of office. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it, it goes back to that whole state of nature thing where people think there's this kind of Nirvana Eden type of thing where we were just these perfect beings before we had this fall from grace. Like that's that's not the way history is. And it also shows the importance and power of people being able to censor. And I think why the United States of America is part, partially why the United States of America is so <laughs> exceptional. It's enshrinement of um, the free speech thing, the right to actually go out and say things, have your ideas actually be heard have information be spread, the freedom of the press. So when you have the press censoring things and choosing, that's what they've been doing for the majority of their existence. They've been choosing. This whole idea of fake news is not new. No. People ch- make choices, even if it's not fake, even if they decide to, com- to to say real things. What they decide to not talk about is something that you don't hear about in the past. The fact that we're hearing about some of these things is the new thing. The fact that we actually have the ability to know some of this information, I think, is, is kind of just it's amazing. I think we should be really... We should really appreciate how how unusual and how positive that is a thing, a state of being to be in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, now the next one, I was number six is the next one. Yes. Okay, number six. Rules shape the incentives, which in turn affect how people perform their jobs, interact with one another, and use the scarce the scarce <laughs> resources of our of their positions. Recall the example of Jason buying a standing desk. Um, the university's rule meant that budgeted funds expired if they were not spent by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, buying Jason a standing desk was not the best use of that $2,000. Uh, 
Perhaps um, the money could have been applied to tuition relief, applied towards upgrading the computer system in the classroom, or carried over to a future semester as a rainy day fund. The university's rules, though, constrained the way it could be spent incentivizing Jason to purchase superfluous office furniture. And this is, uh, sorry, that's it, but Jason is one of the people who wrote it and he told the story about how just the way budgets are and Again, this is what we're talking about. We're not against institutions. We're not against education. It's the structures that they actually yeah. exist in. We can do better. Because what is that? What is that system? What, why is it tied this way? And then why are politicians doing this as well? Why is this coming from the top where you incentivize where, yes, people talk about the the, <laughs> the big, big farmer, big this and this, big that and that. You hardly need to hear about big government. Why don't people think that effect also exists where the government is actually investing certain things, incentivizing, and you, it's paying for certain things? People might say, oh, we pay. You do not pay. Once that money has been extorted from you through taxation, it is theirs to do with what they actually yeah. want. <laughs> like, you don't control it. You control it mostly when it's in your pocket, when it's in your bank account, when it's on your card and things like that. But once it's theirs... It's it's theirs. That's why when they give you a tax rebate, it feels like you're getting money back, they, like they're giving you money, and it's not because your mind understands that once it's taken from you, you're not getting your money back. It's literally like things are taken from you, and now they're like, here's a little bit, here's some crumbs. So just some sort of thoughts on that. Well, yeah, and, and he mentions this in the book too, but I, he talks about. Because of his budgeting, when he would go on trips, he would always stay in nicer hotels and eat in nicer restaurants. And again, same thing. It's like, well, if you have to spend that money by the end of the year, you can't roll it over. There's no benefit for being under budget. You're not going to be under just for the sake of being under. Like, who's going to do that? No, you're going to spend that as you see fit. And the author, I like how, well, both of them, but Jason in this example, he's being very frank. He's like, look, I'm not above corruption either. I'll, you give me the money, I'll spend it as I see fit. So it's just, but again, it's what are the incentives that enable a person to act that way? That's what people should yeah. be asking. Yeah. And then that's the thing. I, I, I expect that other people can think of examples in their daily life when this happens. And this is the difference with that money coming out. Like that money is already out there. So I do understand this. I know if you go to like the absolute anarcho-capitalist, libertarian, full-on type of thing. He's supposed to be against all this. He's supposed to just not even participate. You're not even supposed to be employed by an institution that actually has something like this. And I, I find myself getting to that point where like, I don't even want to actually be paid second, third f from away from money that's been taxed. But in some situations, it's different when the money's already out there and if that money, if you don't actually take that money, it's still kind of a bribe, but it's not like yeah. you have an option of not taking the money or, or taking the money versus investing that money in all these other positive things that you positive or returning it to the people that was extorted from that money's already out there. It's, and as you mentioned, there's actually actual things that could happen where if that money is taken away, the way the system is next year, there might actually be needs for it that are not met because that money has been taken away. So it's, it's a complicated thing. Where do you who are listening to this stand on that thing? Do you think that's the still completely deathly moral? Where it's exactly the same as, robbing someone for 2000 directly versus using money that's already been robbed from somebody in whatever case and you're not involved in that you have no way of giving the people who've been robbed restitution what what what's your thoughts on that um both you and just in general i'm not asking people in general if they can let us know in the comments i don't know well, well again get to get to get to sort of your point about uh purity that's sort of something i've dealt with as well because people will say oh how do you collect unemployment as someone who's libertarian leaning but then i explain well how much have i paid into it how much how much do I pay in taxes versus how much do I benefit from? You could make the case that, okay, I pay for police, which benefit me if I need them, but Social Security is going to be defunct by the time we're old. I, I'm not for all these wars overseas. I don't want to pay for politicians to live high on the hog. How much do I pay into? How much does it be How little rather does it benefit me versus how much do I get back in return? So, and then I add on top of that, if the government shuts down my job in other places, well, OK, this is a problem the government has caused, especially if the infection rate is this low, if the survival rate is 99 point something percent. I didn't say, hey, please shut my shut my job down and pay me to stay home. I never asked for that. It's this is an adaptation given the interventions by the state. And you you can make this argument with other things, too, like, oh, why do why is rent controlled? Why do we have to have rent controlled apartments? OK, well, if there are laws about zoning, there are restrictions on building, then what happens? 
demand of housing is still high. Supply is restricted. So naturally, prices would go up. Well, not everyone wants to pay a fortune for rent. So there's going to be rent control. All these things are the results of previous interventions. Of course, you can read Ludwig von Mises, his book on interventionism and other things for this. But it's worth bearing in mind, whatever you think of the interventions, this is what these are the consequences playing out. Yeah. yeah. OK, um, now we'll move on to number seven. So the last one of these first seven, then we'll go into the two uh, questions about business ethics. Um, number seven. Our final lesson is that good rules economize virtue. On, economize on virtue. <coughs> Most people are neither devils nor saints. They sometimes do the noble thing, often do the selfish thing, and sometimes do the wrong thing, even when it doesn't serve their interests. Sometimes they act badly because they think they can get they can get away with it, and other times because they're on autopilot and don't notice what they're doing. So with that one, I think this is one thing that has been positive for me. And this is also, as I mentioned, that whole Illuminati thing or that whole conspiracy theory, where I used to think it would be better if it was like, okay, the world would have been better. I, would, you, I think in general, the conspiracy theory thing is people say, okay, the world is better than it is, if not for this one group of people messing things up. you know. But I also think about the inverse, where despite being like, despite there not being this particular group or this one group that is only responsible for making all the positive things, we're still as good as it is now. You know, so you, you, you look at it in this way where people just don't know better. I did a recent post about um, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who I think is, I personally, I don't know her, of course. I don't know, of course, I don't know, small world. But I don't mm -hmm. know her, but she seems to be well-meaning. <clears throat> she seems to, I, she says a lot of things that I used to say when I just didn't know that much about economics. And yeah. I see the people kind of supporting what she says. Like people go out, yeah. like there's one thing she's like, oh, we need to, when we talk about tax of rich, we're talking about just the wealthy. And she uses characters of different wealthy people. And she's like, that's like 10, that's like 10 people. Like, oh, yeah. So I yeah, went and checked the top 10 most wealthy. And if you could liquidate all their money, like that would only actually spend, that would actually only pay for less than a quarter of what the United States government spent last year. Yeah. And that's not even accounting for all these stimulus bills or not even accounting for things like th once you liquidate that money, they don't have the investments. All the people who are employed by them having those investments and those assets are out of work or have to re retool. And they don't have the amount to make those billions again the next year because it's less than a trillion from just the top 10. So yeah. I think most people see what she says and they agree with the general concept behind it. But they don't actually understand economics, economics being one of the youngest science, if not the youngest field in science. This stuff is not <clears throat> practical. This stuff is not common sense. This is not yeah. stuff easy to understand. When I start to get in the field, I don't want to say it's not practical. It's what's that term? It's it's reasonable, it follows reality when you actually read it, but the observation sort of common is, common sensical. Common so common sensical isn't right, because common sense is something that changes from how it goes into the world. It's it's accurate. It's actionable. It's it's realistic. It corresponds with reality. But it's it's yeah. It conforms to the reality. Yeah. But at the same point, <clears throat> we have the ability to 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 think and imagine and create all these other things that are not necessarily conforming with reality. Human beings in general don't. We're not we're not necessarily designed to confirm with reality, like the ability to lie, the ability to convince ourselves of these other things that be like I eat this food because it's like I'm these things. Those are things that are adjusting and controlling reality to better to better adjust to us. So I think most people out there just don't understand some of these things. <laughs> well, I, I was gonna say too with the taxes that always comes up, but I, I make the point to sort of add on what you said. If you soak them 100 percent, that's a one time thing. It would it would fund part of the budget for a year. And then what? All these programs yeah. would have no funding because you would have to start taxing lower people. And there, again, it goes to the point about there's not this limitless pile of money that you can just take from and give us whatever we want. If that were the case, again, there'd be no reason to study economics. All these things would have been figured out years ago. And I was going to add on to, to your one other point. It was funny. I, I had a few posts recently about public choice and. One of my friend, uh, Mikhail is his name. He was asking, like, what is this? And I was like, well, it's economics applied to the problems of political science. It's about factoring in people's self-interest, all that. He goes, you mean common sense? I was like, well, I mean, I wish it were. But in, yeah. uh, but in school, we're taught, 
oh, there were the corrupt robber barons, blah, blah, blah. Thankfully, these government agencies came in and saved the day. And there are people who still believe that to this day. And it's they haven't read all the other stuff. They haven't read James Buchanan or Tulloch or these guys or anyone. They just assume, oh, well, we'll just defer to these bureaucrats and they'll take care of us. They'll regulate the rich people and we'll be fine. But again, they don't think, no, these are people that are self-interested, have their own incentives, agendas, all that. And again, I don't, I think part of that is a failure of the school system, but it's like oh, another part of me kind of says it's their own fault for not questioning things. It's like, why, why do you think politicians are, and academics are the sacred class? I keep coming back to that. Yeah. 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 And yeah. these are the things that are, there's some things that are objectively good for your health that yeah. you might not be doing. Like I talked about this in the recent video post about obesity. Like I don't think people who are eating that much are necessarily being like, we know we're actually harming ourselves. There's things in their life that make them think getting whatever I'm getting out of eating this much, being this weight, is more positive than dealing with the things that lead me to do this or some other things in their life that's around it. So that's just somebody doing something they think is good but might be actually harming them. And then also when you're talking about the common sense thing, I think it's fair to say that if you listen to this, you probably live in a place where uh, it's common sense to think that the world is is is, is certain kind of a, a globe of sorts, and it, it kind of rotates around um, the 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 moon. It's a heliocentric kind of thing where it's we rotating around the sun and things like that, and then the the moon rotates around the earth and the solar system. That's common sense now. But for how long was the flat? People still believe in flat Earth. I think there's there's more flat Earth people right now than the heliocentric uh, or the or the um, What's, what was it? Okay, heliocentric is it sun centric? Was it terra centric? What was Some, it actually called? Sounds sounds about right. Yeah, when, when the Earth was in the middle of everything, was yeah. spinning around the Earth. That yeah. was something we could all we could all observe. That's why I'm saying common sense might not be the actual yeah. term. And some of these things that we think we know, and other people we know know, and we think everybody should know because you can just look at it and see it. You have to understand that that's not the way things work <laughs> because you can just look. The same things your average person today can observe about their, them existing on Earth or the planet is the same that people observed 300 years ago. Yet yeah. 300 years ago, people thought the Earth was the center of the universe and flat in general. So, so, I mean, those are, those are things when you look at something like the field of economics and all these things that go in and out, realize it's not that practical. Even if you're not like Derrida, where you're going in and you're intentionally making things, what was it? Um, obscurantism? Uh, uh, terrorism, terrorism, yeah. <laughs> the, the opposite of right terrorism. You really have to engage in that. Things are just not as simple for yeah. various reasons as it might be. So anything well, else before we get I, to the next one? There were, there were actually, I had three different points. There was something I posted uh, late last night. I read about in Gad Sad's book. I had seen this before. I didn't know the term for it. Well, let me see here. Um, what is this called? Uh, let me see. Oh, um, so it talks about... Uh, the illusion of explanatory depth where people think they understand things better than they do. And it's, it's not quite the Dunning Kruger effect because the Dunning Kruger effect is more, more when people overestimate how much they know about something. This is more people think things are a lot simpler than they are. So that goes to the point about conspiracy theories. People think, Oh yeah, clearly the banks are this way because the Jews are running everything and ripping us off. And people just think, Oh, it's a simple thing. But then when you start breaking it down, you realize well, no, this bank has this much interest. This relates to what the Federal Reserve charges for interest. This is where this money goes, fractional lending. So, but I, what it is is that we, again, myself included, we overestimate, oh, we think we understand it a lot better than we do. So, so this is more <clears throat> a projection of the Dunning Kruger effect where it's like I would come into I would come mm -hmm. into a conversation and think and assume that you know something better than you do. Yeah. Versus Dunning Kruger would be, I assume that I know something we're talking about better than I know. Well, it, it's more people think they understand the complexity of a system better than they do. So it's more about understanding the complexity of systems, whereas I think Dunning-Kruger is more you just you think you know more than you do in general. Like, yeah, But I'm wondering, with the complexity of the system, when you say people, I, is it they're themselves thinking they know better or thinking yeah. general public knows better? They they think they know more than they do. And that's, that's what I think what Sad was trying to explain, and I posted an article on it as well, is that people – in their heads, they think they understand the system a lot better than they do. But he's saying that a lot of people will do that because I think it sort of relates to the thinking fast and slow thing. It's that we're hardwired to like sort of seek out these shortcuts to simply explain things like we're not supercomputers that are meant to break things down that in depth in general. So people will find 
ways to sort of simplify in their head. And oh yeah, I understand how everything works, but then they leave out a lot of things in the process. Okay. Yeah. I, I I need to see if there's one for the circle because I might try and coin that. Like yeah. <laughs> we're gonna try to coin the question, the, the Krishna among uh, uh. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> the proposition that says like people project that in general. Because I guess from personal, if you think you understand <laughs> systems better, you project that other people do. But yeah. I'm wondering if there's a specific one to deal with people assuming that the pop the public are more aware of something than they uh. actually realistically should be. I just tagged you in the article. It talks about um, <clears throat> it's called like the limits of folk science, meaning like I think it ha it relates to like the public's what they think they understand about science versus what they actually okay. do in practice. Okay. So, and then the two other points I was going to touch on. I don't know if you got a chance to watch that Anthony Davies video about public choice it was really good, but he makes he emphasizes he emphasizes a term which I'm going to probably bring up now: rational ignorance, where they talk about, for example, voters. Voters don't understand laws in depth because they see it as we're electing people who are going to do that for us. So why am I yeah. going to bother? To, why am I going to bother to learn about this? And it's funny because like I'll get made fun of for not knowing certain things in popular culture. Like, oh, you don't know who this actor is. You don't know who this athlete is. But it's in my rational ignorance to not know because I don't find it interesting. So I'm not going to make an effort to know. Whereas other people may like sports or they may like certain movies more than I do or they want they want to fit in with a certain group. So again, it's in their it's in their interest to do so. It doesn't it doesn't mean uh, either way. It's a quite I guess it's a question of value judgment. It's so people are going to learn things that they find interesting. They're they're going to exclude things they don't. That's I think it's that simple. Uh, that is a good point. Yeah, yeah. and that, that just goes back to the thing where we, we find ways to <laughs> cut things out. And then there could be rational reasons to avoid certain yeah. knowledge. Like it might be rational for some people to avoid the knowledge that supposedly. Is it the, the the galaxies surrounding a super massive black hole? Like some yeah. of those things, they, there are some times where they got some information. Yeah. Where you're like, depending on your understanding, it can just lead a lot more panic and and fear. Like for for example, right now, I don't know, like, no, no, I don't know if it really counts for this. So the pandemic that's going on, it seems like be some people by <clears> not <throat> knowing enough or knowing certain parts about yeah. what's going on, it's raising the actual level of fear versus yeah. what actually actual threat they're actually under yeah. whereas if you just didn't know certain information about it and there's a lot of information that's unknown people fill in those things so maybe someone would be like just don't tell me that like it's almost like why why do you have to tell me that was going on like right now you know so i think that's that's part of it so what was the third point um no, no I, it was basically just that i was i was just going to talk okay. about rational ignorance and that and then to, but i sort of tie it into pop culture and how like i and others will get made fun of then I'll say like, oh, well, they don't know this philosophy. But again, it's like a group of college girls who just wants to talk about the Kardashians and guys that they're interested in. <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not going to make an effort to learn about this stuff. So again, is that acting irrationally? No, they're just, their environment, their social circles, all that incentivize them to behave in that way. So, okay, so yeah. here we go. Now we'll go into the reading of the <clears throat> normative business ethics questions and descriptive business ethics questions. Rule number three here says something about the last six questions. What six? Oh, maybe the six questions here. It's, so it's these actually, are it's, it's, it's se well, it's seven questions in total. It was, I think it was four normative. What was yeah. it? Four normative, three descriptive or something? Let me find here. Yeah, cause, yeah, it is. Because yeah. I, I was just seeing the way it was written. You, you yeah. set them to me in two separate ones. And the second list has three questions. Yet the last question is asking about the last six questions, which means it's asking about the, the, the two questions in descriptive and yeah. the four normative and not accounting for the third in this yeah. chart, which is the seventh. Yeah. So it's like, it's something like that. It's information put out, but then with that, it's not, it might not be straightforward to see what was in there, but my ability to go in. So, okay, so let's, let's actually, yeah. I'm going to ask the questions. And we'll do sure. these or kind of give an idea of why towards focusing on education in particular. I think the topic that we're talking about here. So sure. that, that good? Yeah. Okay, so starting with the normative business ethics <clears throat> questions. Number one, to whom is an organization business responsible and whose interests must it serve? So about the education system, about the schools, about higher education. In on in general, what do you think? What what, what do you think is a really good kind of example to ask this? Well, well, my my response to this, and uh, you see the same thing in the healthcare system, is you have to look at who pays for who versus <clears throat> who receives the products. That distorts the whole mechanism because if it's this this university gets tax subsidies to do this, okay, well that's going to incentivize the university to keep doing things to get those subsidies. So, for example, there's colleges like Grove City College, which have more libertarian and conservative leanings, 
but they don't get state funding, but they're self-funded so they can say what they want versus other colleges. There's the incentive to, okay, say all the social justice stuff because then we get funding in return. And then there's also the question of how much stuff do the students pay into that they don't want? Again, we'll get more to this later in the discussion, but if it, if there's that disincentive where they borrow money, that's either subsidized federally or guaranteed by the taxpayers or something somehow, again, that's going to distort the whole mechanism. It's not they're spending money that they earn themselves out of their own pocket and paying directly, which would say, hey, look, I'm paying for this directly. I'm going to be really careful where this money is going. It's just, oh, don't worry, I'll get a loan. The government will guarantee it or underwrite it. And then, okay, I'm going to assume that that money is spent responsibly. So it's sort of that outsourcing of responsibility, which, again, to a college-age kid, it kind of makes sense. But it's like, that also leads to this money being the fraud, waste, and corruption. And why, why are you paying all this money for things that you don't want? So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So number two, next question. What more limits do organizations face in the pursuit of their goals? Oh, yeah. Well, now, with well, this question, the, is, sorry, before I get to a bit of clarification, I think there might be a difference in like the morality and the, the ethics. I, yeah. I have a, a different separate video talking about the, the way those terms are kind of um, used interchangeably. <clears throat> Yet I think I don't think mm. I don't think they they should be, and I think yeah. this one, it, it, from what I think, this might be more using morals as ethics. So I think morals are more personal. That, to that not to go too often too much of a, of a tangent, but that was actually a split between Murray Rothbard and Ayn Rand. Whereas Rand believed ethics and morals are inseparable, Rothbard okay. believed no, they are separate. Rothbard believed ethics of liberty; these are the things you should be allowed to do in a free society. However, morally, there are certain things you shouldn't do, like. Legally, you know, this gets controversial, but can you starve your children because they're your children and someone else can't intervene? But morally, should you know? That's what he was saying. Whereas Rand would say yeah. ethically and morally, you shouldn't. So that that's sort of the split. Yeah, uh, I think I think that's that's, that's a good one. OK, well, Go what, I, what, what I would sort of say to this is it goes to the first point about budget constraints. It's is it moral to force other people to pay for things that they don't want to do? Is it moral to keep taxing other people to pay for things? Is it moral to raise tuition on students? Is it moral, like like I think of our Congress voting on salary increases, is it, is it moral to charge students more money so professors can get paid more? I, th- th- I think these are questions that at least bear asking whatever yeah, you so think the answers are. It, it, and with those, what kind of limits do you think are actually set up in this yeah. whole situation? I think they're talking about specifically there. Are there any actual limits that focus specifically on their ethics or their morals when it comes to being an institute of education what are what are the systems set up and, and i'm sure there's codes of ethics and things like that you hear people yeah. getting fired for these things yeah. uh, kids uh, getting kicked out of school without having a due process or some kind of thing yeah. so that that's in there so i think there are some structures that are in there but are yeah. they actually valid structures that you think are, are done well that's that kind of a thing that i and, think and to, to the earlier point too people bend the rules when they want like oh yeah. like the example in the first video about oh well you need more diversity in your department but you don't have a civil rights plan so you can't favor the woman but at the same time okay do i hire the more qualified person or do i try and appease the provost by being more diverse and in that situation, things ended up working out well. But again, you're in that tough spot where you have to sort of bend the rules a little either way. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And is it also not, it might actually come into the bottom here where, like, you look at something with some, certain schools and you have certain situations with certain athletes. Uh, if you have a, a, a certain sport that earns the school a lot of money by people coming to watch, by getting the advertising out there, they'll have lower standards of actual um, – of admission, they'll have some lower standards for, to get those people into school. Like your average student needs a 3.0. Uh, your star athlete might need a 2.0. And then yeah. uh, once the athlete is actually in school, they might be allowed to do certain things, to go to certain classes, do certain things to other students that are not necessarily treated in a similar way than other people. And then now there's actually protected groups now where if somebody in a protected group might have a certain complaint, that will be treated in a separate way than somebody else because they know like the actual general effect of this gets public. So there there are certain things in there where the ethics and the morality between some of these, I think, are are, are getting kind of dicey. And it's it's a a tough thing also to do. I'm not saying it's a simple thing to do, but these big, massive institutions with millions of dollars on the table, it's it's going to muck things up. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Number three, um, whom should organizations hire and how should they treat employees, customers, suppliers, um, others who have a stake in the organization? Yeah, so that's that that sort of that, that sort of relates to what I said to the first one about how okay what how 
how much of a role do students actually have in influencing what the universities do with their money, especially if it gets subsidized or they they get taxpayer guaranteed loans or all that. And uh, again, it, we'll we'll get more into this as the discussion goes on. But that's why it creates all these perverse incentives where it's not. I go to a business, I buy something directly, I pay the money that I earn directly. There's a very clear, straightforward exchange here. There's all these different outside factors and things that sort of muddy it up. And there's a really good chart. Maybe we can include it that uh, I think it was Milton Friedman used it in the past where it was, OK, if you pay for, if you pay your if you pay for something yourself and it comes at your own expense, you're going to economize and seek the highest value. If someone else pays for it, OK, like in Jason's example, you're you're likely to seek the highest value but not economize. And then if it's if someone else pays for it, someone else picks for it, you. Well, like if someone else is paying and it's for someone else entirely, well, that that whole mechanism gets completely distorted because what's the incentive? It's I'm spending someone else's money on someone else. I'm not going to be careful with it. Uh, I'll, I'll find that chart. But but again, it just yeah. it illustrates the point of, again, even if you get the good people, what is the incentive to spend and behave responsibly? There is no incentive because it's the different people are on the hook in different ways. Yeah, yeah that's that's the thing. There's like it's, it's four different sections to do with your amount yeah. of choice and and the and the possession of the money and whose money yeah. you're actually spending. It's it's a really excellent thing that I think is applicable. So yeah, we'll try to include that with the post of this. Sure. Um, was there anything else again with the customers? This goes again to the that question number one, with the callback to the organization business responsibility. Who do you think in general out there? Uh, it's a question for everyone. Is who is the customer? Are the students really the customers of schools? Especially when you go to those schools with like high um, financial aid by the government. If it's the government who is the main person paying and backing up the student loan, then is the student technically actually the customer in that kind of environment? It's the same thing people ask when you're talking about social media. When you're using some of these things for free, are you really the customer if you can utilize that thing for free? Or is there some other mode where you might be some kind of product or you might be, um, I don't know, the government, it's not necessarily, it might be a tool or something. There's, there's something, I think there is some bigger interaction going in there. We're like, okay, let's say your parent is paying for the actual school. Who is the actual person yeah. that the actual school, the person providing a service is saying, we, you are our customer. It's the, who's paying? The paying customer. The customer is always right, right? The customer is always right, and the government is the one paying, and then they're the customer. Then are they the actual ones who are always right? So that's yeah. kind of. I think they're more suppliers. It seems like are they, are they more suppliers? I don't know. What's the government? They're supplying the students. What's happening here? <laughs> okay. So question number four: What do individual employees owe the organization and society as a whole? Now, again, this is specifically for schools. What do you think with this one? I, I mean, that gets tough because, of course, the objectivist in me wants to say, well, there's no such thing as society. It's just individuals pr pursuing their own well, self-interest and all that. Yeah. And so I'm I'm sort of I'm a little at odds with that premise as a whole. And what do they owe the organization? Well, again, ideally, you hire professors. You want to hire people who bring prestige, people who teach well, people who do research that is monumental and that puts the university on the map, all that. So. You could argue that sort of the we'll get into it in the section on tenure too, but that's sort of the cost benefit of we'll take a risk with this person and put them on tenure track, and if they live up to it, they're tenured, and then they'll be what we'll have we'll we'll have somebody really good on staff that will continue to benefit the university. But of course, it's sort of that cost benefit of okay, and then if you were to fire that person, they were to go somewhere else, and they were to have a breakthrough down the line, you would miss out on that. So. It gets complicated now. It's interesting, the section on tenure, I'll get more into it later, but th there's actually the argument made that tenure does not improve the quality of work because certain people know, okay, I'm safe now, so they don't try as hard. It's one of those things like I I've made the comparison in my own experience, like people who are friends or with or related to the boss, they're going to get they're going to try and get away with certain things or not work as hard because they think, oh, well, I'm not going to get fired. Why should I care? So it creates yeah. that perverse incentive as well. And this is something that we we mentioned a bit in the first part of this. There was a, a, a example that was given that somebody was deciding between hiring this, I guess, white male who was yeah. more qualified to teach a certain, certain subject. But then they decided, oh, should we hire this other female? Of I think it was a, it was it was a female of color or just a female? I think it was just a white woman. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was just another female. Well, somebody of different gender, or that would give some kind of does does the university or the organization feel like the higher education organization? feel they owe their students some more representation or is it about just the information? 
Then when it goes to the actual teachers themselves, you hear a lot of this of teachers coming out and saying, oh, we need to open our kids up to social justice issues, to critical theory issues, to all these other things. It's not just math. We need to queer this. We need to queer that. Because they feel like they have this, this dedication to society. It's not just getting my paycheck that says I need to impart information about X mathematical formula to this student so this student can go on and engineer X things or Y things. It's no, it's we need to add A, B, C, D or all these other extra things as a responsible member of this society, as a teacher. That's the whole aspect that that is in there that that is a bit a bit, a bit creepy to me because I'm, I'm like, like I said, I'm focusing on education, not schooling. I'm focusing on what's the best way to get information X to this other person that wants information X so they can go out and do Y, Z, A, B, C, D, and all those other things. We'll get into another section in morality, but they talk about that in there too, how people people will do good things, but there there is still self-interest factored in. And sometimes there are situations where people do things that will benefit other people, but at the same time, their self-interest is factored into it as well. So you could make the case that in certain Cases like like you just mentioned, people are trying to do the right thing, but there is a self-interest in it in terms of, OK, we want more people in our department. We want more funding. We want a job. We want to raise all that. Oh. OK, so getting some knock on the door, got get, get to finish this up, wind this up soon. OK, so we're getting into the last three questions. The third question is about the other questions, so we're getting a little faster with that. But yeah, so. The first question in descriptive business ethics questions, and this, as I mentioned before, is number five in the entire questions that's supposed to be taken together, is why do people in an organization sometimes act unethically? Um, what, what explains how they make decisions about right and wrong? So, yeah, with this one, I think we've talked about this before with these other incentives, but what, what do you yeah. think with, it, with this? Well, again, same thing. I think they, like with the Jason and the desk example, it's just the incentives are such in such a way that it gets people to act those ways. And I, I keep making fun of it, but that whole thing about, oh, we just need better people. It's like people respond to incentives in general. People are generally self-interested. Like you might get the one in a million person who says, I'm going to put my self-interest aside and self-sacrifice for this. But again, it's like, having faith that there's going to be that person coming along. Uh, I just, I think it's a fool's game, honestly. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, and this is another question to any of you out there. You, have you had certain ethical decisions to do professionally in, in your field or in your work or that you've been around that, or that you've seen that you kind of agreed with, like, okay, this person explained why they did that. And you're like, okay, that kind of makes sense. I think I would have done that in their example. So that's the question. If you just have any answers or thoughts to that, let us know in the comments, wherever uh, this may be. Okay, number two or number six. What physical, mental, uh, organizational, or budget constraints do individuals and organizations face? Yeah, I think with this one, it's as you said, five hundred billion is what what's spent, and yeah. I think I said with the higher education, it's. Uh, I checked, and it was about nine thousand institutions, about nine thousand five hundred institutions in the United States of America use five hundred billion dollars. Now, uh, I'm not good at math, so you can divide that up into into those institutions. But I guess you can round it up to ten thousand, and then you can go it up. It's a, it's about fifty million, I think. I could be wrong. I could be, wrong. I could be, I could be Carry the zeros 50, 50. a few times. Yeah, I think it's something like fifty million or five. It's not. I, I feel like fifty million is is too high. It could be fifty million or five. I could be getting zero. One of the zeros wrong. Or you but also, also those yeah. numbers refer to averages, as we'll get into. Something like Harvard is going to spend yeah, a lot more than on average. You know, yeah. on, on average, and and this is the thing that goes into that. So, is it on average um, you pay the on average what seventy thousand a year for for Harvard or something, or versus a seven thousand dollars a year school? Now, those two different those two schools, like if they're teaching English one hundred and one. How much different is your English 101 in Harvard versus in some community, let's say it's community college where it's paid through taxation, where technically the student or their parents are being taxed, have been taxed an equivalent of the entire time living in that nation or that area. So it comes down to them, each student actually being paid by the government uh, about 2000 a, a year. So yeah. that 2000 a year, even let's say cut down to semester, 2000 a semester, English 101 at the, at, the, at the public school, at a community college, learning Shakespeare and stuff like that versus learning it at Harvard. What, what is the, the major difference? Is it really a, like, is it really a $68,000 difference by going to those different places? And if you're saying that's further, does that mean it's going to be completely impossible for somebody in a, like a school here in Kenya 
to learn certain things about English because at this school, it's spending that student is probably maybe paying two hundred dollars a semester versus a Harvard person. So these are the kind of things where what, what do you think are, the, are some of the constraints that uh, that people actually face in these? Well, as far as again the budgeting thing we sort of talked about, but also the issues as far as we'll, we'll get more in it on the different sections, but about how colleges like the different departments want more staff and they they want to beef up their departments because then that justifies more funding. So it's how, how much are they willing to push in order to do that? And then the fact that it's also what Anthony Davies talked about in that video about concentrated, what is it? Dispersed cost, concentrated benefits where it's like, okay, we can give the illusion that if, if we get, just charge everyone an additional $6 a year for a rock climbing wall, okay, that's not much <laughs> money. But but that but then you you add that up again times hundreds or thousands of times. Well, you're you're paying for all these pet interests and special groups. But at the time, the university sees it as okay. We want to placate these people, and then the students think ah, they're not going to notice an additional six dollars on their tuition. But again, you keep adding that up over time, and it's it's the same thing too. Think about how spending your own money. Like I've made this mistake too. Like oh, I'll spend five bucks here. I'll spend five bucks here, 10 bucks here. And you add it up, you're like, whoa, that's a lot. But it's yeah. it's easier to let that sort of slip away from you if it's incremental amounts. And that's sort of the issue I think colleges have as well. Huh. Okay. And the last question here is, how can we use the answers to these last questions? They say six questions here, but as I mentioned, a different list. Last questions to produce bet, uh, better behavior. Now, with this one, with mentally, I think even that last one might have been one of the key things because some of the physical, mental, organizational, I focused most on the budget constraints. But there are things, some cultures, some homes, that you might get made fun for studying. You might get fun for speaking in a certain way. So you yeah. might avoid learning in some certain way. Mental, there's a lot of mental issues. Somebody might say, oh, we need these kids to learn in person so you can't do this remote learning. They need to be in one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. Then it's yeah. like, okay, they need to be one on one with the teacher. Shouldn't you encourage at home tutors versus putting some kids in a schooling, in a, in a factory schooling type of system where they're sitting there in a classroom with 30 other people in they only have 45 minutes or sometimes 30 minutes. So each student at most, if the teacher actually came in and was like, I'm going to spend one on one time with each student, it would be at most one minute per student. But that's yeah. not the way it is. You normally come in and teach some kind of rote kind of uh, thing from something that's already set that takes 20 minutes or so. And then you have smaller time where people are working together. Then the amount of time it takes for people to settle down and actually start learning. So that whole idea that, oh, they benefit more from that. Does that really happen? And the last one is uh, the organizational. That's that's another thing. The organizational, like how are you organizing this? Why are you saying that everybody at a certain age needs to be in the classroom at the same amount of time? You start that with K-12. And that sets people up for university. But this is one thing that I've seen that's better with higher education is you see, like, you can have an, that English one-on-one -on -one class if I'm making fun of, but there could be an 80-year-old who decided to come back and get some few degrees. There could be some kid who just moved in from another country that doesn't know English. There could be some other kid who's like, who really wants to learn Shakespeare, has been acting in place since they were a kid. And so those all those people can be in the same place. They could all be different age ranges, different for different reasons. But now... It might be okay to just have that, but then you have some of the kids who are just trying to get some kind of uh, requirement for their general studies. Now, that one kid out there who just the general studies might join that class in a way that kind of disrupts all that actual intention that everybody else wants to learn that actual topic with. Or sure. that kid might bring in a new age. So there's the organization. Are we really organization or organizing the way we teach people in the proper way? And to finish off with what I'm going to say with us, I think part of why it's very important to think about this, especially right now, is with this pandemic, I think it's given the world an opportunity to sit back and really rethink the whole education business, the whole way people learn when it comes to just school in particular, when it comes to educating the youth, educating people into new things, where entering a brand new world, a brave new world, <laughs> all the so hopefully it's not with eating the young and eating the older, things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's a spoiler for that book, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I might, I might that out. <laughs> but, uh, but that whole idea with that, where it's, it's, um, we're, we're entering that right now, so it's important to look at these things going forward. You, yourself, what do you think with, uh, with the last questions? What, well, how do you get out? I was just going to comment. Uh, first, you said I realized you said "brave new world." At first, I thought you said "whole new world." I thought you were referring to Aladdin. I was like, "Oh well, no!" Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 I guess it's kind of the carpet in an embrace, kind of the the coronavirus would be the ca the carpet that's floating us to a new world. I don't know. Or the genie, <laughs> genie in the bottle, the the bat, the bat in the lab, or the bat in the market. I don't know. The pangolin, <laughs> whatever you want to think it came from. But I don't know. Yeah. 
But but to sort of add on to your point, that's one thing I really like about this book is like I, I feel like it's one of these things where they don't give all the answers, but they at least ask a lot of the right questions. And I think my hope is that more and more people ask these questions. Hopefully we will get to some right answers because I think the university system is really failing at what it's intended to do. And of course, we're going to provide lots of evidence for that. But I think if people ask these questions that can at least sort of point us in the direction of, okay, maybe this could be done better this way. Okay. Maybe there are alternative forms of schooling. Maybe people don't have to pay a fortune to get educated, et cetera, et cetera. And I think long run, we'd all be a lot better for it. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it for me. And, yeah. Um, that's all. That's all I have. So this was, as we mentioned, this is something we're going to be referring back to. And then uh, now today or later on today or tomorrow or soon, we're going to keep going in this series. And as we mentioned in the first part, we are going to be going chapter by chapter. This is going to be a separate one. So this is going to be one of at least 12 more parts, I think, because there's uh, 10 more chapters we need to. So there's, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's 10 more chapters we need to go to. And then one more review after that. Story. This is one. This is going to be one of. 11 more parts. Again, <laughs> this thing was not going to throw yeah. out of my draft. <laughs> so, so that's it yeah. for me. I'm going to go and handle this familial issue that I, a familial obligation that I have to deal with right now. And um, Stephen, I, I will call you back or we'll get back in touch with you and see about recording that the next part of chapter two. Sure. Okay? Sure. Okay, cool. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye Stephen. Bye. Bye. I'm going to. I don't know if it can fly. I'm just gonna leave it out here a minute.